the whole book into an, an hour's time or, or a half hour's time, and it just, I didn't even come close. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to preach half of the book this week, and then I'll preach the second 11 chapters next week. And then we're going to go back and take the next few months and just kind of go by verse by verse and pick up all the details. But the reason why this is very important to me, um, the reason why I want to do this so quickly is because I think it's, it's really important that uh, you get a handle on this book in general. I mean, most people are intrigued by the book of Revelation, right? I mean, I've never met a Christian that just kind of goes, eh, I don't really care about the book of Revelation. It doesn't intrigue me, doesn't interest me, whatever happens, happens. It's pretty rare. Most people want to know what is inside of this book. It's, it's kind of cool to learn about the end times. But most people are scared to open up the book of Revelation for themselves and study it. Because it's kind of intimidating. And I know some of you have probably started to read the book of Revelation. You read a few chapters and some of the symbolism and everything else gets you confused. And you just put it down and you say forget about it. And a lot of people never pick up up the book of Revelation again because it's so confusing. So what I want to do this week and next week is kind of simplify the book for you. Kind of give you an overview of the whole book and every chapter and what's in it. So that you can pick up the pieces, so you can pick up the book yourself and read it and not be so confused. And so this week I'm going to go through the first 11 chapters of Revelation. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll look at this book and it won't be so intimidating to you anymore. It won't be so confusing to you anymore. So if you don't have a Bible under every other chair, uh, there is a Bible place there. Uh, We put that there so that you can use it because there's no outline this week. We're just going to be jumping from chapter to chapter. And those in the satellite service, if you need a, a Bible, raise your hand, and the ushers over there will pass one over to you. Hi. Um, but uh, if, if you got a Bible, um, turn to... Uh, do we need one up here? Oh, okay. Well, uh, all right, pass one over there. Turn to Revelation. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. So you can just turn to the very end and just follow along with me. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And it says this. Chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what this book is about. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation means revealing. Or uh, um, it's kind of like uh, the unveiling. You know how when they have a a grand unveiling they pull the curtain off of something like wow look at you know you finally get to see it that's kind of what revelation is about it's like this revealing of jesus christ that's why this book is so important and i think it's imperative that every christian understands the book of revelation because without it you have a very shallow view of jesus christ you don't get the whole picture you don't get to see him in all of his glory and what it's going to be like when he returns that's what Revelation does. It's this, it's this revealing, this unveiling of Jesus Christ, of his character and who he is and what it's going to be like when he returns to the earth. Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, that's us, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, or take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So understand, how we got this book is by John. Remember John, he was one of the disciples, one of the twelve disciples of Jesus, and uh, he's the one that, that was often called the beloved disciple. And John gets a vision. He, gets, he, he hears these words from an angel. His angel gives him these words. And, uh, and, and now that we have them, he says, Blessed is he who hears it, who reads it, and takes it to heart. Now look at verse 9. This, this describes how he got this letter. Verse 9. It says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a voice, a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay, 
So he, he says, okay, here I am. He goes, John, he goes, I'm your brother, I'm your companion. He goes, and I'm on this island called Patmos. Why is John on this island, Patmos? Well, remember there are 12 disciples. And after Jesus, you know, ascends back into heaven, they go out and they start sharing their faith. Okay, Judas had already died because he hung himself. Remember that? And now you got these other 11 disciples. They're preaching about Jesus everywhere because that's what Jesus told them to do. Well, the Roman government didn't like that. And they, they sought to kill anyone that preached Jesus Christ. So what happened to all the disciples is that what church history and tradition tells us is that all of these disciples were martyred in one form or another. Um, whether they were crucified upside down, some of them were beheaded, you know, stoned. They, they were all killed except for John. John was the only disciple that we know of that was not martyred. Instead, though, what they did with John was they took him and they put him on this island called Patmos. It's kind of like an island that, that was for exiled people. So that they were kind of uh, just kept separated from everyone else. So he wasn't martyred. He was just put on this island so that he couldn't go witness and tell other people about Jesus. And so John says, here I am on this island of Patmos. And he says, on the Lord's day, you know, in verse 10, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. So maybe he was praying or worshiping or something. Um, and he says, and I hear this voice behind me like a trumpet. And he says, you know what? Just write down what I'm about to tell you and then send it to these seven churches. Okay, so this is how we get it. It's this voice John hears, he's on his island, he hears his voice, he says, write down what I'm about to say, and then send it to these seven churches. These seven churches are literal churches. It'd be like if someone said, hey, send, send one to the church in, uh, you know, Anaheim, you know, send one to uh, one in North Hollywood, you know, these specific churches. Send them this message that I'm about to give you. And so these seven churches back then, they existed in Asia Minor, which is uh, modern-day Turkey in that area, and so they're the first ones to get the book of Revelation. Okay, so John hears this voice. He's about to write, but he turns around to look at who's talking to him. And in verse 17, look at what happens. Verse 17 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Okay, so John turns around to look at who's talking right now and telling him to write this stuff down. He says, when he gets a glimpse of this person... He is so horrified, so in shock by his appearance, he says, it's like all the life came out of him and he just fainted. He fell over like a dead man. So who is this being that John saw? It explains. It goes on in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Who's that? It's Jesus. It's Jesus himself that John sees. And we know it because look at verse 18. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. Okay, that gives you a clue. You know, who else died and is, is alive forever and ever? And I hold the keys of death and of Hades. And look at 19. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Okay, this is a very important verse. Verse 19 outlines the whole book of Revelation. He says, write on a scroll what you have seen. Okay, what did he just see? This vision of Christ. He goes, and then write down what is now. He's, and in chapters 2 and 3, what John does is he writes to those seven churches things that pertain to their time. He goes, then I want you to write the things that are about to take place. And that's what chapter 4 through chapter 22 is all about the things of the future. And that's the bulk of Revelation is this prophecy about what's going to happen in the end times, what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so you got that? Are you following me so far? So John's on this island. He hears a voice. It's Jesus. Jesus says, write this stuff down that I'm about to tell you. I'm going to tell you about things that you already saw, things that are taking place now, and things that are going to take place in the future. So chapter 1 was what he saw. Chapters 2 and 3, these are uh, chapters 2 and 3. You can turn to chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2 begins these letters to the churches that were in existence, to these seven churches. Jesus Christ had a message to each of these seven churches, and that's what chapters 2 and 3 are, are just letters. And, and for example, look at, look at verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. Okay, understand, Ephesus is a city, and there's, there's one Christian church there, and he says, you know what, tell the angel there. And you're thinking, angel? 
The word angel can mean angel, like an angelic being. It can also mean messenger. Okay, so most people interpret this to say, okay, the messenger there in the church in Ephesus, or the pastor there, the one who speaks for God. Okay, so, so the pastor can be interchangeable with angel. So I'm, I'm like an angel. He, uh, so he says, you know, tell the pastor over there in Ephesus, I've got some things to tell that church. And then here's what he says in verse 2. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. So Jesus says to that church in Ephesus through their pastor, he says, you know what, this is, what, this is the message to you. You guys are doing a lot of good things. You're doing a lot of good works. You're teaching all the right stuff. He goes, but I got something against you. There's something about this church that bothers me. This is God speaking. He says, you've lost your first love. It's like you've grown cold in your faith. It's like you used to love me. You used to love people. But now you're still teaching all the right stuff. It's just that the love's gone. And he says, go back to that old love. You ever been to a church like that? Where it's like, you know what? They're teaching all the right stuff. They're doing all the right stuff. But it seems like there's no love in the place. No one genuinely loves God. No one genuinely loves each other. That was his message to that church there in Ephesus. And so chapters 2 and 3 are just a bunch of letters like that. to several different churches that are all struggling with different things. So then we go to chapter 4. Chapter 4 now starts getting into the future. And before I get into it, let me say this. A lot of people believe that that as we start talking about these future events from chapter 4 on, a lot of people believe that the rapture, have you heard of that term rapture? It's the time when God will take all the believers from the earth. A lot of people believe that the rapture takes place before we get to chapter 4. Okay, that all the believers on earth are somehow mysteriously taken up into heaven by the power of God. That's what that book series Left Behind is, is all about, you know, the movie that just came out. But it's a whole idea that all the Christians on the earth will be taken up to heaven before this end time occurrence takes place. So that means any day before this stuff happens. Um, and the reason why some people espouse to that is because in chapters 2 and 3, he's talking to churches. But then from chapters 4 all the way to the end, he doesn't even mention the church. So a lot of people say, well, maybe because the church is already gone by that time, and he's already taken them up into heaven. Because chapter 4 gives us a glimpse of heaven. And look at verse 1 of chapter 4. He says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice I had heard, first speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Okay, that's another reason why people say, well, what's, what do you mean after this? What's after this? Well, maybe after the church age. After, you know, this age that we live in with all the churches existing, then he gets to see something else, and John gets to look into heaven. And look at verse 2. It says, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resemb resembling an emerald, encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. Okay, this is kind of weird stuff. John now gets this vision of heaven, and he gets to see God. Okay, and this is what he sees. He sees God. He's sitting on a throne. He's trying to describe him. He goes, gosh, he goes, there's like stones, like emeralds, like jasper, like all these different precious stones. It's just God on his throne. And he says, and around his throne were these 24 other thrones. And these elders sat on these 24 thrones. What are those 24 thrones and those 24 elders? I believe it represents the church. I can't get into it right now, for now. Uh, just trust me, because I'm usually right. Um, and uh, <laughs> we'll get into more in the weeks to come. But, but for now, you, you've got this vision of heaven. John, this, all you need to know about chapter 4 for now is, okay, he sees God on his throne and all these other thrones around him, and everyone's worshiping this God. Okay, then go to chapter 5, verse 1. 5.1, it says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Okay, he's looking at God on his throne, and he sees that he is holding a scroll in his right hand. Okay, if this were a scroll, 
He says that scroll was sealed with seven seals. See, what they used to do on the official documents of the Roman government, you know, or title deeds to property or whatever, they, they would seal these scrolls. And how they would seal a scroll is this. They would put a piece of wax right here where the paper is going to come apart right there. They would put a piece of wax that holds it together. And then a person with a, a signet ring would kind of push his insignia on that piece of wax. And they went hard and they would be sealed. Now, you were not allowed to open that scroll unless you show that you've got the ring or whatever type of stamp that fits into that wax seal. And so when the Roman government could tell if someone had tampered with their documents because that seal would fall apart. And they were not allowed to open it until they could show that signet ring. Now, it says that there are seven seals. And what, what that means is, okay, here's the seal in the, in the beginning. You open it and you roll it up, or unroll it a little bit, and you'll see there's another scroll, another seal. And you have to show the ring again. Okay, I can open this part too. Um, so basically, you open a seal and you can read for the first one-seventh of the document. And then you need the next seal and to show that you have uh, authority to open the next part, the next part, next part. You got that? So, so God's holding a, a uh, what is it? Scroll, thank you. A, a scroll in his hand, and it's got these seven seals on it. Okay, you got that picture now? John is looking up. He's seeing God holding the scroll. And verse 2 of, of Revelation 5, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Okay, you got that picture? God's holding the scroll. He's got the seven seals. And everyone's going, oh, man, I want to see what's inside because this scroll unlocks this future mystery of how the world's going to end. And everyone's like, gosh, I want to see it. I want to see it. But no one can open it. John is so devastated. It says he's crying. So one of the elders says, wait, here comes someone who can open it. Here comes Jesus. And Jesus now opens up the scroll in chapter 6. Okay, so chapter 6, verse 1. It says this. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. So he's reading that first part of it. And look at verse 2. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Okay, this is about the point where everyone puts down the book of Revelation and says, I don't get it. Okay, so he opens up a seal, and he sees a horse. Big deal. What am I supposed to take from that? Okay, this is, what, this, this is describing the beginning of this end time period. The first thing that's going to happen is represented by this rider on a white horse. And uh, this, this, this rider on a white horse, he has a, he has a crown. So somehow he is a ruler. He also has a bow. It doesn't mention any arrows, but he has a bow. And so many have said that this seems like some sort of ruler who rules the world not, with, not by making a war and taking it over, but somehow by b bringing peace upon the earth. Okay, and let me explain why we get this. Okay, turn back in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Um, in, in fact, if you have one of these paper Bibles, it's on page 624. That helps, you know, it's kind of cheating. But uh, Daniel 9. I've talked about this prophecy before in the Old Testament. This is the prophecy, remember, of the 70 weeks or the 77-year periods? And I talked to you about the 69 weeks and how it all calculates out you know, from the time it was written to the very point when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Pretty amazing stuff. Well, at the end of the prophecy, it talks about another seven-week period. And that's what it's described in, in Revelation. But look at Daniel 9, verse 27. Daniel 9.27 says this. He will confirm a covenant with the many for one seven, or one seven-year period. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offerings. 
And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Okay, go back to the beginning of the verse. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven-year period. Okay, so it seems like someone is going to come along and make some sort of covenant or some sort of seven-year peace treaty with the world or with many people. And yet in the middle of that seven-year period, it says, in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Where do the sacrifices take place? In the temple, in the temple there in Jerusalem. Okay, and it says, but in the middle of the seven years, he's going to stop the, the sacrifices. Now, there's no temple in Jerusalem right now, is there? No, it's just the Dome of the Rock. And the Jews have wanted there to be a temple there, but you've got the Arabs there. There's been this fighting that's been going on there for centuries now. And right now it's amazing that in our day and age, I mean, it's, it's heating up again. Now, what is going to happen, what appears will happen, is someone is going to come alongside and bring peace to that situation. You know how Clinton tried to come alongside the two leaders and bring peace and he didn't really do it? Okay, someone is going to come alongside and bring peace to where somehow the temple can be rebuilt. And it seems like the two will be able to coincide together. That, that's our best guess. It seems like that's what's going to happen because he says that sacrifices are going to be taking place until the middle of that seven years or three and a half years into it. Then he's going to break the covenant. And then there's, he's going to set up something in the temple, it says there in Daniel 9. So the temple's got to be there. And he's got to set up some sort of statue there which is the Antichrist kingdom, which we'll talk about next week. But uh, that's what's going to start the war. So is that giving you a little bit of picture? This is the Old Testament now talking about someone coming and bringing peace. That's why. That's why we go to Revelation 6 and that first seal that is broken. That means the first thing that's going to happen is this guy that's been talked about in Daniel, now talked about in Revelation, is going to bring peace to the Middle East. He's going to bring peace, and the whole world's going to follow him because how in the world did he bring peace? He must be an incredible leader. But then keep reading in Revelation 6. So that's the first seal. Is Someone's going to come along, and we may be gone from this earth by then, or we may experience it, depending on what view you hold. Um, but then verse 3 of Revelation 6. It says, when the Lamb opened the second seal. Okay, now he opens the second part of it. I heard the second living creature say, come. And then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and make men slay each other. Okay? That's why we believe, okay, that three and a half years of peace is put to an end, and now there's war. Just like Daniel said in the Old Testament, now you're seeing it in, in Revelation. It seems like someone's going to come along, bring peace, then after three and a half years, the next thing that happens, someone else comes along, or maybe it's the same guy, but now there's going to be war, just like, uh, just like Daniel prophesied. Now it goes on in verse 5. It says, the lamb opened the third seal, and uh, I heard the living creature say, come, I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And when I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. What on earth is that? This guy comes along, the third seal, he sees this vision of a guy on a black horse and he's holding scales, you know, scales where you, where you, you weigh things. And the guy is screaming, he says, a quart of wheat for a day's wages. A quart of wheat isn't it enough for a meal for one guy. So he's saying, you know what, you could work a whole day and your wages would not give you enough to pay for one meal. Basically, it's famine conditions. He's saying that after, after there's peace, then there comes war, and then what often follows war is famine. Okay, so that's what happens next. Then he goes on in the fourth seal, verse 7. When I opened the, uh, the fourth seal, look at verse 8. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, so the fourth thing that happens, he says he sees this pale horse, and the rider's name is Death, 
And it says that he's given power to kill a fourth of mankind through the war, through the famine, and through plague. So it's kind of just a natural progression. I mean, you imagine, you've got peace, and then you have a war, and with war comes the famine, and then famine comes some plague. And he says, you know what? By that time, a fourth of mankind is dead. A fourth of the population has died by these wars, by this famine, and by these plagues. And then you get to the fifth seal in verse 9. It says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So he opens the fifth seal and he gets a glimpse into heaven again. And this time he sees it's, it's all the Christians who died during the tribulation, who were martyred. Okay, because that Antichrist, or that leader, we call the Antichrist, who is going to set up his kingdom is going to make it illegal for anyone to worship God, like it is in some countries already. Um, he says, it's illegal to worship Jesus Christ. I want you to worship me. And so he puts to death anyone who proclaims the name of Jesus. And so in this fifth seal, John gets a glimpse of heaven and all these martyred saints who are crying out to God and saying, God, when are you going to avenge our blood? When are you going to go down to the earth and destroy these people for what they have done to us? And that's where we start the sixth seal. And this is where it gets really eerie. Look at verse 12. It says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. The stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called out to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Okay, so he breaks open that sixth seal, and this is where it gets scary. I mean, not that the other stuff is normal, but uh, the sixth seal, and he says that, he, he says, I saw like stars falling from heaven. Maybe these were meteors or whatever, just hitting the earth. He says, uh, he goes, it was like the sun turned black. The moon turned like this reddish color. And he's just seeing this massive destruction. He says, it's like the sky falling down on the earth. It's like when you shake a fig tree when it's ripe and everything's just falling down. He says, that's what it feels like, all these objects hitting the earth. It's getting destroyed. And it says, it's getting so horrible that it didn't matter. He goes, the princes, the kings, everyone was just running and wishing that the rocks and the mountains would fall on them and kill them because they were so terrified by the wrath of God that was finally being poured out on the earth. It's pretty terrifying as he's opening up and explaining what goes on in the end times. So then we go to chapter 7. Now, chapter 7 is interesting, okay, because you, you be, don't get confused here. Chapter 7, what he does is he's just described some of the end time events. Now in chapter 7, he goes back and he fills in a few details, kind of like what I'm doing this morning. You know how I'm kind of just kind of flying through the book? And then I'm going to go back in the weeks to come and we'll go into the details and talk about all this stuff. This is what he does in chapter 7. He explains something that was left out. Chapter 7, uh, verse 2. He goes, Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Okay, see what's going on here? He says, before all this devastation comes, one of the angels cries out, wait a second, before we pour out all this wrath on the earth, first, let's, let's seal those who serve God. And it says that there were 144,000 that they sealed on their foreheads somehow. So that the angels would know not to harm them. These people are protected by God because they love Jesus Christ. And yet it says that there are 144,000 from the tribes of Israel. So 
So these are Jewish people. So somehow in the midst of the tribulation, there will be 144,000 Jewish people who give their lives to Jesus, who decide to follow Jesus, and the Bible says that they will be protected during this calamity. Now, it's interesting because remember when we studied the Old Testament, God always said that he was going to protect the Jewish nation. Remember he said there will be times when they'll just barely be hanging on by a thread? He goes, but no one will be able to destroy that nation. And he says there will always be a remnant. There will always be a remnant of true believers amongst the Jewish people. Here is the fulfillment of that. Here in the very end, here is the remnant, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe that is sealed by God. And uh, it goes on in, in, uh, in verse 9. It says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. So it's beyond 144,000. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Okay, so now John sees a vision of people beyond the 144,000 because they're from every tribe, every nation, everything else. And they're before God worshiping him. And look at verse 13, and we find out who those people are. Verse 13, one of the elders asked me, because John speaking, one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? You know, I mean, the elders asking John, that's kind of weird. So John responds in verse 14, he, he says, I answered, sir, you know, you live here. You know, I, you know, he's, you know, I mean, you're the one, you got to tell me, you tell me who these guys are. And he says, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. Okay, it seems like, okay, I say seems like, this seems like these are people that are in the tribulation who after they begin to see some of the events, they realize the Bible really is true. This whole revelation thing really is how the world's going to end. I'm going to believe in him now. But that's what it appears to be. These people are saved during that time because you read on in verse 14, it says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Remember, uh, if they were in the tribulation period, they would experience the famine. And so he says, never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, which is another one of the curses, which I'll show you later. Nor any scorching heat. For, verse 17. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Okay, so these are the people who endured some of that tribulation. And it seems like at the end, you get a picture of them before God. And God wipes every tear from their eyes and said, you know what? You went through so much pain, but now you're in heaven with me. You will never experience pain again. Now let's go to chapter 8, verse 1. And here finally is the seventh seal. Remember, Jesus has been opening the scroll. And we've, we've seen so many things happen. Now he finally gets to the very end, the seventh seal, and that's chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Okay, so he opens the seventh seal, and everything is totally quiet for a half an hour. Now some scholars have pointed to this verse to prove that there are no women in heaven. Okay? <laughs> But that's, that's not really the point here. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, what is this silence? Why is it silent for half an hour? How do they, why is it quiet now for half an hour? What it is, is this. Okay, Jesus has been opening this scroll, and the things are pretty amazing. It's pretty devastating. But when he opens the final part of it, and everyone gets to kind of see what's there, it is so awesome, so terrifying, that... There's just kind of a hush. Up until then, everybody's been worshiping and saying, all these, God, praise God, praise God. And then he opens the seventh seal and it's like, whoa. This is horrifying, what he's about to see. What is it? Verse 2. I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay, so what is that seventh seal? It's these seven angels lined up. And each one of them has a trumpet. And then look what happens in verse 7. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And it was hurled down upon the earth. 
A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, a third of the green grass was burned up. Okay, so the first angel blows his trumpet, and John says, I saw like, you know, it's, it's like hail, fire, um, blood. It's just some sort of mixture coming down to the earth that burns up a third of the vegetation. Then he says in verse 8, the second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Okay, so the second angel blows his trumpet, and John says, I see like this huge mountain that's just on fire, and it, it just looks like it falls into the ocean, and it turns the ocean into blood. Um, he says it's like a third of the ocean, so it's probably like, you know, maybe the Pacific Ocean or something like that. You just see this huge thing just come down on it and destroy the whole ocean, destroy all the, all the animals there, destroy anyone that was on a boat that was out there. It's all gone. Then he goes on in, in verse 10. It says, I, the third angel sounds his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Okay, so the third angel blows his trumpet, a star falls on the rivers and the, you know, the streams and all the drinking water and turns it bitter, a third of it, so that if anyone drinks it, he could die from it. Then verse 12, a fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. Okay, so the fourth one, something catastrophic is happening now. The sun, like a third of it is blacked out. A third of the moon's blacked out. And it kind of has an effect on the stars, and a third of those are blacked out. And he says it, it's, it's to the point where, you know how right now the world system, the world is just working so perfectly as far as the earth and how it spins around the sun and the stars and everything else. just uh, amazing. And he says it's not going to be like that. God is going to pour out his wrath on, on the creation. Um, and the sun now is turning black. The moon's turning black. The stars, some of them are gone now. And then look at verse 13. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet ba- blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. So after those four trumpets, he sees an, an eagle flying by going, Wait till you see the last three. You thought this was bad. Wait till you see what happens next. Revelation 9, verse 1. It says, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. What is the abyss? The abyss is like a dungeon in the depths of hell where demons have been bound up. And it says that this star is given the key to open it up. Now understand, when you hear the word star in Scripture, sometimes it, mentions, it refers to the stars in the sky, but sometimes the word star can also refer to angels or angelic beings. Okay, in this case, I believe is an angelic being. I think it's fairly obvious because, because he's given a key. It's hard to imagine a star coming down. Hey, I got a key. Uh, you know, it just, it just doesn't seem like that. It, it appears to be Satan coming down the fallen angel coming down, and he unlocks this, this dungeon in hell. And in verse 3, it says, Out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. Well, pretty freaky stuff. It's like these demonic, locust-like beings go around, and they sting mankind. Not people who have been sealed by the seal of God, but everyone else. And it tortures them for five months straight, but they, they can't die. They just have to endure the pain. Verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounds his trumpet. And listen to this one. Verse 14. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this hour and day and month and year 
were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. Okay, what is the sixth trumpet? He says, at the sixth trumpet, and understand the geographical location, he says, at the river Euphrates, there have been these four demonic-type angels who were bound there. And at this point, God releases them and says, okay, now you can release this army that's been bound up at the river Euphrates. Okay, where is that? That's over by Asia. Okay, and it says, at that point, God releases this army. These angels released the army to go out and kill a third of the world. Okay, so much of the world's already dead. So at this point, I mean, we're talking half mankind's already gone. This, this, this army goes and wipes out a third of the people that are alive still. Now, people have questioned, is this a demonic army or are these actual people? I believe it's actual people. I mean, you can take it literally as 200 million mounted troops. And the interesting thing is this. Back in the 80s, Around 1988, Time Magazine wrote an article, and in that article in Time Magazine, it says the number of troops in Red China, the Red Chinese Army now numbers over 200 million. Okay, coincidence? Maybe. But just just kind of amazing things that are going on. So uh, look at verse 20 now. It says, The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons, idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, wood idols that cannot see or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their theft. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so the people that are left on the earth, they still don't finally bow down to God. Instead, they go back to their sin, and you go, well, that can't happen. Absolutely it would happen, because look at the arrogance of man in the day and age in which we live. What happens when something horrible happens? Do they come before God and humble themselves? No. What do they say? God, how could you let that happen? How can there be a loving God in heaven if that just happened? How, how, can, my mom, how can my mom have died if there's a loving God in heaven? What do you think is going to happen when the world is starting to get destroyed what are people going to do? Look up in heaven and say, okay, God, now I'll humble myself? No, they're going to go, God, if you just killed my whole family, I'm not going to worship you. And they'll shake their fist at God. And they'll go right back to their sin. They'll say, there must not be a God if all this stuff is happening. Not realizing this is all written and it's going to happen. So we go on to chapter 10. Before we go to chapter 10, we're going to take an offering, but we're not going to sing or anything like that. They're just going to offer while I'm talking because we're out of time. Um, so I just come on, take an offering, and I'm just going to talk while... Is this okay? I mean, I don't know if that's a sin to not have special music during offering. But, uh, but uh, we're going to... You know, so I'm just going to keep talking. Um, so just keep reading along. Well, first write your check. Make it a big one. Throw it in the um, offering. And then uh, I'm going to keep reading. Okay, because we're almost done. We've got two chapters in about three minutes. Listen to this. Chapter 10, verse 1. He says, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Verse 2, he was holding a little scroll. Okay, verse 3 is very interesting. He gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Kind of weird, huh? Because... Uh, John hears these thunderous voices, and he's about to write down, because he was told, write everything down. But a voice from heaven says, no, no, no. This, I don't want you to write down. I don't want you to write down what these guys just said. Why? I don't know. It's a mystery. It's one of those mysteries. We don't know this about the end times. What is this that he's talking about? But go to verse 9. This is kind of a weird verse, too. He says, so I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. What is that? So John goes to the angel and goes, hey, can I have that little scroll? And the angel goes, all right, but you got to eat it. You know, so <laughs> what is that? And, uh, and it says that John eats this little scroll, and it's sweet in his mouth, but in his stomach it turns sour or bitter. I believe this little scroll, it seems to just symbolize the bigger scroll and everything that's going on because it's like there's a sweetness to all of this, isn't it? 
Because you realize, man, this is when Christ, I'm so sick of sin and all the you know, persecution on this earth for Christians. And it's like, finally, Christ is going to take over the world. This is awesome. But the more you read, it kind of makes you sick to your stomach, too, because you realize the devastation that's going to take place at this time. You go, wow, this is really horrible. And so that little scroll just represents the bigger scroll where John's saying, man, this is good stuff, and yet it's horrible stuff. And then we go to verse chapter 11. This is the last one we're going to look at today. Chapter 11 is, again, going back to, uh, you know, kind of giving a, another overview of some details that were left out over these first six or seven, uh, the, the seven seals and the, the trumpets and all. Look at verse 3, something that's going to take place. I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. You guys, what's 1,260 days? Three and a half years. Okay, remember how I talked about how it's a seven-year period broken up into these three-and-a-half-year periods. Okay, so I believe this is during the first half of the tribulation when there is peace and everything else, that, that there are going to be these two witnesses on the earth. And the reason why it's 1260 is because the Hebrew calendar has 360 days in it. Okay, so if you calculate it all, 12, 1260 days is three-and-a-half years. These two witnesses are going to be telling people about the truth. They are witnesses for God. I believe that's how the 144,000 Jews come to believe, possibly, is through these two witnesses. God has a witness on this earth. Now look at verse 5. It talks about these witnesses. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devour, devours their enemies. Okay, so this is, these, these are unique people, okay, to say the least. God gives them this power and John's just describing this. He goes, this is what it looked like. It's like they'd open their mouths and fire would come out and, and just destroy anyone that tried to harm them. But, but keep reading. Look at verse 7. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city. That, that's Jerusalem. Okay, so, so Satan's given power to kill these two witnesses. But look at verse uh, 9. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. So it says these guys, they just leave them on the street, these two dead witnesses. And it says everyone in the world will see them from every nation. How can we accomplish that? Television. It's broadcast. You know, this, this is stuff that can only be happening now. Everyone in the world is seeing these two lying on the street. And then look at verse 10. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts. Okay? The world gets so arrogant, they're going, look, we killed the two witnesses. These guys, they, they looked at them as evil because they were against the Antichrist, who was really the evil one, and they're gloating over them to the point where they're sending each other gifts because they're going, all right, this guy, they, we killed him. Here's a fruitcake. You know, uh, it's amazing. Just the arrogance. Look, we won, we won, we beat God or, or, or whoever this is that sent these these two witnesses, and look at verse 11, though. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. No, duh. You know, I mean, these guys are back to life, and everyone's like, oh, here's your fruitcake back. You know, uh, <laughs> they're back to life, and God takes them into heaven. There's an earthquake. Okay, look at verse 15. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. Okay, the last trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Okay, so with the seventh trumpet comes the actual return of Jesus Christ, which we'll talk about next week. Very important, okay? This is, this is signifying the very end when Jesus Christ actually returns now. After the plagues, after the wrath, after all that stuff, Jesus Christ returns. We're going to get into it next week. But real important because in chapter 12 and 13, which we're, where we'll start next week, we go back. Okay, so far we have seen everything that has taken place from God's perspective and what the angels are doing. But 12 and 13 are awesome chapters because they go back and explain what Satan is doing during this whole time. And that's where in chapter 13 we start talking about the Antichrist, you know, the mark of the beast and the one world government, one world currency. And we can go all the way to the end until we get to heaven. Okay, but that's next week, so make sure you don't miss that. But speaking of Antichrist, 
make sure you go out and vote this week. Okay? Um, <laughs> you guys, honestly, as Christians, I mean, it is so important. And I, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm not going to push you one way. Push you. Did I say vote? <laughs> I'm not going to. I, I did not say that. I'm not going to push you one way or the other, but I am just saying, you know what? What we, are, what we are called to do as Christians is not, you know, say this guy, that guy, this initiative, that initiative, or whatever else. But I believe God has called us to use our own wisdom, you know, and this, this book, you know, God's word, and, and use that to guide us in how to vote. And so I would really encourage you guys to do that this week. Go out to the polls and make sure you make your voice known. Let, let me pray for us. Father, I, I, I thank you for this book of Revelation, God. I am terrified by it. Um, yet at the same time, Lord, I get so sick of the sin on this earth and people who mock Christians and make fun of our morality and make fun of your morality and, and make fun of you and God. So in a sense, I look forward to that day when you return and make everything right. And yet, God, there is this bitter, sick feeling in our stomach when we realize how you're going to do it. And it's terrifying. But God, I pray that today you, you have opened our eyes to the book of Revelation so that we don't seal it up and not ever read it. I pray that you've opened our eyes so that we can understand it. And I pray for everyone in this room that as we go in this study of Revelation, that it will open our eyes to many things um, and really reveal to us who you are. Because, God, you all that matters is you. You're in control of everything. You're in control of the end. And so, God, help us to worship you this week with fear and trembling. Let us be in awe of who you are. And, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. And the fact that we are sealed, your word says, by the Holy Spirit of God to show that we are yours, protected, your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week. This week we started a study in Revelation. And my goal this week is to kind of complete this this brief overview of the whole book. And uh, the point of last week and this week is not so that you totally understand every detail in the book of Revelation. The point of last week and this week is just to give you an overview. And my desire is this. I've had several people come up to me last week and this week who have said, I have never opened the book of Revelation to read for myself because I've always been so scared of it. Um, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I I read it and it it terrifies me and a lot of it I don't understand. Well, what I'm trying to do is, is get it to a point where you can understand the book. You can open it and read it for yourself. And for, in fact, I encourage you. Would you try this week to read through the book of Revelation? I mean, after this week's message, you should have a pretty good outline of the whole book so you can read it for yourself and understand it. But would you do that? If you just read three chapters a day, by the time you got here next week, you will have read through the book of Revelation. Okay, just just three chapters a day. In fact, I timed myself last night. I read through three chapters, and I read slowly, and, uh, and, and it took me four minutes and 50 seconds. Okay, so in less than five minutes, and I understand I'm Asian and everything, but still, <laughs> for, I, I think most people can read it, you know, in a pretty short period of time. But so we're not asking for all, you know, like an hour a day, you know, study this book. I'm saying five minutes, you know, can you spend five minutes and just just read three chapters a day? Because I tell you, it's one thing to hear it from me, but it's a, it's a complete different thing when you read it yourself. And when no one else is around, you just take five minutes and read the Bible for yourself. I tell you, it is so much more powerful. And so I want to give you an overview so that you can understand. And so when you read it yourself, it's very meaningful to you. Now, last week, we studied the first 11 chapters of of Revelation. And this week, we want to read uh, chapters 12 all the way to the end. Um, But let me give you an overview again. Okay, let me give you an overview of the first 11 chapters real quickly. Chapter 1 is, remember, Jesus is speaking to John, and he tells John, write down what you hear. And so John begins to write it down. And then in chapters 2 and 3, chapters 2 and 3, is uh, those are seven letters, remember, to the seven churches that were in existence at that time. And each one of those letters was a message that God had to send to each of those churches. Then we get to chapter 4. Remember, chapter 4 is when John gets to see what heaven is like. And he gets to see God on his throne. John sees God on his throne and everyone is worshiping him there in chapter 4. Then in chapter 5, John notices, hey, God has a scroll in his hand, a scroll with seven seals. And everyone's saying, who gets to open it? And then Jesus comes and Jesus gets to open the scroll. 
And then in chapter 6, he begins to unwind this scroll, you know, and he opens up to the first seal, and you see a white horse, and the white horse represents peace, showing that in the beginning of the end times, there is going to be a time of peace. Remember when we went back to Daniel 9 and showed that it looks like three and a half years of peace led by this Antichrist? And then you, you open up the seal a little bit more, the second seal, and he saw a red horse. The red horse symbolizes war saying that someone's going to come in the, in the middle of that time and he's going to take the peace from the earth and there's going to be all sorts of war. He unrolls it a little bit more. And then the third seal was a black horse. And, uh, and I just make sure, a black horse. And uh, the black horse, the guy on it was holding a pair of scales. Remember showing that there was going to be famine, showing that you could have a day's wages and it still wouldn't be enough to feed you. Um, then there's a fourth seal. He opens that up and there is a pale horse and, uh, and the rider's name was Death. And it showed that through all the devastation so far, a fourth of the inhabitants of the earth would be killed. He opens up the fifth seal. And on the fifth seal, it's a glimpse of heaven again. And this time there are, there are martyrs, people who died during the tribulation. Because during that world ruler's rule, he makes it illegal for people to follow Jesus Christ. And so he, he kills them. And so the fifth seal is this picture of these martyred saints who are crying out to God, saying, God, when are you going to avenge our blood? Jesus unrolls the scroll a little bit more in, chapter, in, verse, uh, in the sixth seal. You begin to see it a little bit more where uh, there's a great earthquake and the, the moon turns blood red. And then all the stars from the sky start falling or meteors or something begin to hit the earth. And it's, and it's pretty chaotic. And uh, so then you have the end of chapter 6. You go to chapter 7. Chapter 7 is where they talked about the 144,000, the Jewish believers who are going to be sealed somehow so that they are protected during this time of wrath. Uh, and then in chapter 8 is when Jesus opens the final seal, the seventh seal, and it says that there's silence in heaven because it's just so awesome what they're about to see. And they see these seven angels with trumpets. And after each angel blows his trumpet, there comes some wrath. The first angel uh, blows his trumpet there in chapter 8, and it says that uh, he sees this, this mixture of hail and blood and fire that starts falling onto the earth, and it burns up a third of the earth. The second angel blows his trumpet, and he sees this big mountain, just a blaze of fire hitting the ocean, and it says it destroys a third of the seas. The third angel blows his trumpet, and he sees this blazing star come down to the earth, and it hits the water, the, the rivers, the springs, and it uh, contaminates a third of the waters. And then the fourth angel blows his trumpet, and something else happens. A fourth angel blows his trumpet, and a, a third of the sun goes black, a third of the moon goes dark, a third of the stars go black, a third of the day is without light, a third of the night is just pitch black. Um, and, then, and then the fifth angel... In, uh, in chapter 9, the fifth angel uh, blows his trumpet, and then a star, or Satan, comes down, and he unlocks the pit of hell. Remember that? And he allows these demons to come out of, the, out, out of hell, and uh, they're like locust-type beings with this scorpion type of sting where they're going around stinging everyone, everyone that isn't sealed with the seal of God, and uh, they're stinging them, and it's a torturous sting that doesn't kill them, but it tortures them for five months. And then uh, the sixth angel blows his trumpet, and that's when, remember the river Euphrates, those angels that were there, released the army of 200 million. And the 200 million mounted troops go out, and they slaughter a third of the world. And then, uh, and then chapter 10. Chapter 10 is when, remember John hears these loud, thunderous voices speaking, and he begins to write it down, and God says, don't write that down, I don't want it written. And it's a mystery, we don't know what that's about. That's when the angel with the little scroll is holding it, and, and John goes, hey, can I have that scroll? And the angel says, sure, but you got to eat it. He eats it. Uh, it's sweet in his mouth. It's bitter in his stomach, showing that, gosh, there's a sweetness about this end times. It's great, but it also, there's this bitter feeling in my stomach and this bitter taste of it all when I see the devastation of God poured out upon mankind. And then, uh, then chapter 11, where we left off last week, chapter 11 was the two witnesses. Remember, we talked about how there are two witnesses on the earth that God uses to proclaim his gospel. And yet, uh, when people attack these two witnesses, they breathe fire out of their mouths. 
and they show all sorts of signs. They have all sorts of power to release plagues upon people. The people finally kill these two witnesses, and everyone rejoices. Everyone sees it, and they're sending presents to everyone. And then these two witnesses rise from the dead, and everyone is terrified and uh, give their presents back. Um, And, and, you know, one thing I want to say about that, those two witnesses, I said last week, I think I said last week that those two witnesses are during the first three and a half years of this seven-year tribulation period. I don't believe that anymore, okay? I believe they're in the second half. The more I studied this week, and, you guys, this happens in the book of Revelation. I've gone back and forth on some things, uh, but the more I study, I'm pretty convinced these two witnesses during the second half of the tribulation um, I may change before the series is over, but you've got to understand something, though. It brings up a good point. As we study the book of Revelation, there are things that are pretty clear. There are other things that we're not sure about, and I'll let you know those things. You know, we're not totally sure about this, and, and no one knows for certain where these two witnesses live. Is it during the first three and a half or the second three and a half? I think it's the second three and a half, but bottom line, it doesn't matter that much. And I don't want us to get into a lot of debates during this time of revelation. I want to focus on the things that we do know and most scholars do agree upon. Because what happens so often with the book of Revelation is we get to these details and everyone starts arguing about, no, I think it's this, I think it's this, and we miss the big picture. Man, everyone knows God's going to win at the end. Everyone knows there's going to be just utter devastation and that's what we've got to focus on. Everyone knows in the end that we reign with God forever. And that these are the main points of, of the book. And so understand, there will be different things as to where the rapture is, whether there's a millennial kingdom, you know, when the witnesses are there. I'm not saying it's not important, um, but it's not the most important thing in the book. So I don't want to focus too much on that. So with that, we come to chapter 12. And chapter 12 is where we pick up the narrative. Chapter 12, um, this, is a, this is a picture of Satan, you know? What is Satan doing during this time? Chapters 12 and 13 kind of show the devil and uh, his role in history and his role in the tribulation period. To understand chapter 12, you, know, you have to know that there are three main characters. There is the woman, there is the child, and there is the dragon, okay? The woman represents the nation of Israel, the child represents Jesus Christ, and the dragon represents Satan. Okay, and you'll see that. It's clarified as you read the narrative. But when you read it on your own, just so you know, when you read about the woman, the child, and the, and the dragon, that's who they are. Uh, look at chapter 5. I'm sorry, verse 5 of chapter 12. It says, She gave birth to a son. She, who is she? Israel. Gave birth to a son. Who is the son? Jesus. A male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Okay, so that is Jesus Christ, uh, who was born out of the nation Israel. Go to verse 6. It says, The woman, Israel, fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. What is 1,260 days? Three and a half years, exactly. So somehow Israel, remember the 144,000 that are sealed, they're protected by God? Part of their protection is they're taken to this place in the desert or some place where they're hidden so they don't experience a lot of this wrath that the rest of the world is, is facing. They are hidden there. They're protected for 1,260 days. Verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Okay, so then it shows this war. Not God himself fighting Satan, but the the high archangel Michael is fighting against Satan. And you see Satan losing and being thrown down to the earth along with the angels that were following Satan. And that's where we go to chapter 13. Satan is now hurled onto the earth. In chapter 13, we see a little bit of what he does during the tribulation period. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says, And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. 
Okay, now we, we're in chapter 13, verse 1, and, and the dragon or Satan, he, you know, John sees Satan standing on the seashore, and uh, this beast comes out of the ocean. Now, this beast is who we have termed the Antichrist, or this is that ruler that first brings peace to the earth from the first seal. It's referring to this one world ruler. Okay, there's going to come a day when we're going to work toward a one world government. We're already working toward it. I mean, we're already, you know, we've been pursuing that for a while as, as, a, as a people. This is one world government. Well, it's going to happen. It's going to be under the reign of this guy, the Antichrist, or what he's referred to is the beast here. Okay, look at verse 5. This beast, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given authority to make war against the saints and to conquer them. He was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So here's a guy who is obviously against God, and yet he becomes the world ruler, and all the nations begin to follow him. But not only they begin to follow him, look at verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. So this is a different person. This is not the first beast. A second person is going to come. This is a person we call the false prophet. And look at verse 12. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf. And he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Okay? So it's not enough that this guy is ruling the world. The second guy comes along and tells people you need to worship the, this ruler. Okay? You need to worship this man. Okay, now, how do you get people to worship someone? I mean, you can't really get people to worship a human being, can you? Well, this is how he does it. Look at verse 14. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the nations of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, great and small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Okay, you guys have probably heard of the 666 before, but let's, let's go back. Okay, how does this second person get everyone to worship the first guy? He does miraculous signs. Okay? In fact, it says that he, he creates like a statue or some sort of image of the first guy. You know, he just makes an, a, a statue of the first ruler. And what he does is he empowers the statue to begin to speak. You know, imagine if some guy comes along and he is able to create these statues and then makes these statues speak. Then he begins to call, you know, like fire from heaven, all these different types of signs. You go, okay, this is not a normal human being, and he is telling me to worship this guy. I'll worship him. You see how the whole world begins? To, because that could happen. I mean, if someone that powerful was here on the earth, something we've never seen before, people would worship him. Not only that, but the beast says, look, you have to take my mark upon you. And if you don't take my mark, I'm not going to allow you to buy or sell. Remember, it's a one-world economy now. It's under one ruler. And we're very close to this. I mean, we've been moving toward this cashless society. I mean, we've been moving toward that in our lifetimes. It's amazing to see the development already. I mean, how many people really use cash anymore? You know, and it's, we use these credit cards, and when you swipe a credit card, they know everything about you. But what happens is we lose these credit cards, and they get lost. Other people use them, and... So I believe there's going to come a day when those credit cards are obsolete too and you receive a mark instead. I think it's similar. I'm not prophesying anything here, but I'm just saying that, you know, right now we, they already do it to dogs. They put a little chip, you know, behind their neck so they can scan it and they know the dog's name, where he lives, and his favorite food. You, you already got that. Um, so to, to, to transfer it to humans and, and the whole idea of putting this mark on the hand or the forehead, in cold climates, those are the two parts of the body that are most readily exposed. 
you know, and, and in a lot of places, you know, where it's freezing, it's like, all right, go scan me. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's right there. Um, so that's, that's the whole idea of this mark. And it said that, you know what, you can't buy or sell. So you want to feed your family and go to the market and buy something? If you don't have the mark of the beast, sorry, you can't do it. We don't accept cash. We don't accept credit cards. You know, we're in this cashless society now. So that's what it appears that we are heading toward. And we're appearing like we're heading toward this one world government. It appears like we're heading toward a one world religion. As so many religions of the world are coming together and say, you know what? We all believe in the same God, right? And so that's what this false prophet is getting everyone to worship the same God that we all believe. Then he transferred that worship to this beast. So you understand how we're heading towards that right now? That is what Satan is trying to do. Revelation 13. Now we go to chapter 14. And it says, Then I looked, and there before me was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Okay, who's the lamb? Jesus. He says, this is the very end now. Okay, he's going towards the very end of time. It is said that Jesus Christ will come back and he will stand on Mount Zion. This is a literal place right outside of Jerusalem. Uh, I was there, and you can look outside the, the, the east gate there in Jerusalem, and you see this mountain range, and you just go, okay, that's it. You know, God's going to return. Jesus Christ is going to return. And here it says that 144,000 are with him. He's going to stand on this mountain. There's going to be this great earthquake. There's going to be this great slaughter. And that's what it's describing in chapter 14, verse 1. Then in verse 6, it says this. And then I saw another angel flying in midair. And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Okay, so the first angel says, You know what? Worship the true God. The second angel says, you know, Babylon the Great has fallen. Babylon the Great is just another name for this end-time kingdom that the Antichrist leads. This one world government, this one world uh, religion is referred to as Babylon the Great. And, he, and the second angel is saying, you know what? His time of reign is over. The Antichrist time is over. It's God's turn. And then in verse 9, it says, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, for anyone who receives the mark of his name. Okay. Because this is, uh, this is why we need to proclaim this stuff. The Bible says if you take that mark, that's automatic condemnation on you. And you'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Not temporarily, not till you die. It's eternal torment for those who have taken the mark. And okay, last week I mentioned, I, I lean toward the belief that the church, all the believers will be taken out of the earth before this tribulation period. But let me say this. There are a lot of great scholars who do not believe that. It's, it's pretty split. And there are a lot of people who believe, no, the Christians do you know, exist throughout the whole tribulation period. And so I'm not going to argue that. All I'm going to say is I personally am prepared either way. One, if Christ returns today, I'm going with him. I've got a relationship with God. You know, if he takes all the believers of the earth, I'll be one of those that'll be flying out of here and you won't see me anymore. I'm there, okay, because I've got my relationship with God is intact. If it's true that we live through the tribulation period, I'm ready for that. If an antichrist comes, if a world leader, he's not going to call himself antichrist, if this guy comes and leads the world and tells me to take a mark, I'm not taking it. He tells me to worship him, I'm not going to worship him. If it becomes this one world, you know, religion where everyone says, hey, we got to all just, you know, love each other and just all love God together. I'm not going for it. There's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And that is what Scripture teaches. And I got to stick with these convictions, and I'm going to, even if it means it costs me my life and the life of my family. Because the Bible says, if I take that mark, that's it. I'm tormented forever. 
And I'll go through whatever torment I need to here on this earth, if it's a year, if it's 10 years, if it's 50 years. But it's, it's all worth it rather than taking the mark and being tormented for eternity. So that's chapter 14. Um, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, uh, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. Okay, so here he says, now there are seven last plagues. Okay, at the end of chapter 14, it, it talks about the last trumpet. Um, but now it's saying, okay, remember there were seven seals, you know, that he unrolled. Then there were the seven trumpets that came out of that, the seven angels with the trumpets. Now he's saying it's the very, very, very end of it all. And now he sees seven angels with bowls. And each time one of them pours out a bowl, it's, it's like pouring out wrath upon the earth. And this seems to go really quick. It could be a matter of minutes that all of this happens. It could be longer. We don't know. But it seems to happen in succession very, very quickly. Um, and, and we read about this in chapter 16, starting verse 2. It says, uh, The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Verse 3, The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Verse 4, The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. Isn't that sad? I mean, can you picture all this devastation happening in the earth, and now the sun is scorching everyone with intense heat to where you're burning up? And still these people, instead of repenting, they look at God and say, God, I can't believe you would do this to your creation. You are not allowed to do this. And God says, watch me. He goes on in in verse 10. He says, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Okay, so the sixth angel, um, his, his, his wrath is, is that, that river Euphrates. Remember when we talked about the river Euphrates and how that army of 200 million would, would come from there? Um, some would say that this is relating to that same incident. Some people believe that it's two separate incidents. We don't know. But somehow he releases uh, these armies of the world and these spirits come out. And it says that uh, these spirits go around to all of the nations and they call all of the nations to come to this one place for this great final battle, this great final war. And uh, you read about that in verse 16. It says, They gathered the kings together together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Okay, you've heard of that term, Armageddon, the great battle of Armageddon. This is it. All the nations now are gathered in this place, and it's, an, it's a literal place. You can go there now. I went there last year. It's this, it's this valley of Megiddo. It's huge. It's massive. Napoleon said this is the greatest battleground on this earth. Okay, just this huge open plain where all these people come to for some sort of war we don't understand the cause of it yet maybe they're all going against israel maybe they're fighting with each other all we know is that in the midst of this war jesus christ returns and everyone begins to try to fight against jesus christ and that is when god just decides i'm i'm killing them all he wipes them all out you read about that actually in the previous chapter but it talks about this angel taking a sickle and just Slashing everyone. It talks about this tremendous bloodbath where it says it's, it goes on for 200 miles, just blood everywhere. All these people are slaughtered who try to fight against God. And that's what is described in verse 17 when it says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. See, when Jesus Christ returns there on Mount Zion, it says that when he steps foot on that, 
on that mount, the, the city's just going to divide. It's just going to crack into three parts. It's just this tremendous earthquake. It's all the armies are there, and God destroys them all, and it's just a tremendous bloodbath, and that's the way it all ends. When we go to chapter 17, um, verse 1, it says this, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I'll show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Okay, so in the midst of all this, John gets to see, he says, look at what happens to the great prostitute. Who is the great prostitute? Um, This refers to this whole antichrist kingdom again. We we know that because look at verse 5. It says, this title was written on her forehead. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Okay, Babylon the Great, again, that, that world system, that one world government, one world religion, headed up by the Antichrist. The Bible says, look at how it falls. It is just destroyed. It calls it the great harlot or the great whore, the great prostitute. Why is that? It's because this one world religion is considered the great whore. Why? Because the church is the bride of Christ. We who believe in Jesus Christ and trust in him alone for salvation, the Bible refers to us over and over again as the bride of Christ. We are his bride. We are the one that are going to get involved in this marriage to Jesus Christ in that last day. But who is this world system and this one world religion that everyone else joins into? It's a harlot. You don't get involved with this great prostitute. And that's why we say, look, it doesn't matter how popular it gets. When everyone in the world is saying, look, one God, why are you Christians so intolerant? Why? Because we're the bride of Christ. It's not because, you know, just because everyone's doing it, we can't get involved in that. Okay? That is the great prostitute. That is the great harlot that will cause all sorts of people to follow it. But we are the bride of Christ, and we follow Christ because one day it says that great harlot is going to fall. That's why we don't get involved in, the, in this one world you know, you know, government and take the mark because we know the end, it's going to fall. That's why we don't take part in this one world religion. We know it's all going to fall. The Bible has told us the end. In fact, you look at chapter 18 and, and look at verse 8. Chapter 18, verse 8 says, Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine she will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. How long is it going to take for this system that everyone thinks is invincible? Hey, we've got world peace. We've got one government. What we've always wanted. Of course you've got to join in. Of course you take the mark. We've got one religion. No more battling between all these different faiths. Everyone believes in the same God. That seems pretty powerful, and yet the Bible says in one day it's over. God's going to destroy it, so don't fall for it. Chapter 19, after the destruction of everything, look at chapter 19, verse 1. It says, After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again, they shouted, Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Okay. It says in the end, he hears heaven now cheering, roaring, screaming. It's over. Okay. This world system that sucks so many people into it. God has destroyed it. And now it is his time to reign. The rest of the chapter talks about Christ. You know, it, it gives him a picture of him riding on this white horse in, in chapter 11. I might as well read it. Verse 11 of chapter 19. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So you have this picture of Christ returning now with these mighty armies. His robe is dipped in blood, probably from this big blood bath that he has just slaughtered so many people, and it's signifying their, their blood being 
splattered on his robe. Then you get to chapter 20. And this is interesting. Chapter 20, verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Okay, so now Christ has returned. He's here on earth, and he's got all these, you know, saints with him. And it says that Satan now is bound. An angel comes down. He binds the dragon with a saint with a chain, and throws him in this pit. You remember the same pit that Satan had the key to? Now the angel has the key, and he locks Satan in this pit for a thousand years. Then look at verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, I believe this thousand years are literal. Um, there are people who believe that it isn't literal. To me, I, I just, there, there's, a, there's a, a real simple saying in, in biblical interpretation to this. If the literal sense makes sense, seek no other sense. In other words, if it makes sense as it's written, don't try to allegorize it away. Don't try to say, well, maybe that symbolizes this. Maybe a thousand years symbolizes this. No, if it makes sense literally, just accept it. And this, to me, makes sense literally. Christ returns, and there's actually a reign of him here on this earth for a thousand years. And John said some of those, those people who were martyred, who were beheaded, and you know, I don't know how he knew they were beheaded. Maybe they are just putting their heads back on. They come back to life. And they reign with Christ for that thousand years. Christ sets up a kingdom here on earth for a thousand years, a time when Satan is bound. Some people say we're actually in that period. I go, that's impossible because Satan is alive and well here on the earth. In fact, the Bible warns us, you know, beware of him. He's like a a roaring lion, you know, seeking someone to devour. During this period, Satan is bound. He's not doing anything. Christ rules the earth. Righteousness reigns it's it's what the earth was intended to be verse 7 when the thousand years are over satan will be released from his prison will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth okay so after the thousand years satan gets a little breath of life here on the earth to try to deceive people again and isn't it amazing that he is successful in deceiving people even after a thousand year of christ reigning on the earth it shows us that even with satan not here the depravity of man people still will not want to worship God. And at the end, Satan is still able to deceive people. But what happens to those people? Look at verse 10. It says, The the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Go to verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, again, this is the lake of fire, Satan's doom. That's where he is thrown. That's where the beast, the the false prophet were thrown. He says, anyone whose name was not written in the book of life, he is thrown there as well. And it says that they are tormented day and night forever and ever. Some try to teach that hell just means annihilation. You go there and you just cease to exist. It's not what Scripture teaches. Um... Scripture teaches a place that is far worse than that, where people are actually tormented there day and night, forever and ever. Then chapter 21, verse verse 1, it says, I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And this is where it gets real good. Look at verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now, after all of that comes the eternal state, where now there is a new heaven and a new earth, where we are with God forever. This is how it ends. For those who believe we're with God forever, the, the others are in the, 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 the lake of fire to be tormented forever. We're with God where there's no more pain, no more weeping, no more crying. It's done. God has finished his story. He has finished with his work on this first earth. It is over with. We are with God to celebrate for all of eternity. That's how the story ends. 
And let me just close with chapter 22, verses 10 and 11. It says this, Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. He says, you know what? If you're doing wrong, just keep doing wrong. What does he mean by that? He means this. He says, if you can read through this whole book of Revelation, as we have done these last two weeks, if you have heard these messages through the whole book of Revelation, and after the end of all of that, you still decide, "Ah, no big deal, I'll go back to my sin. The Bible says, no hope for you. Go back to your sin. You're going to keep sinning till the end of time. It's a scary verse. See, if you can read all the warnings of Revelation and that does not literally scare the hell out of you to get your life together and start walking with God, if that does not cause you to walk with God and walk away from your sin, he says, you know what? Nothing's going to do it. But for those of us who do right and say, you know what? I recognize God's in control. I'm not going to try to fight him. I'm going to worship him. He says, you guys, keep doing it. Keep worshiping no matter how hard it gets. Do the right thing. Keep doing what is right. Keep worshiping God. And that's what we're going to do right now. The worship team is going to come up. And you guys, I I want you to picture yourself truly worshiping God right now. Because this is what those of us who believe in Jesus Christ will be doing for all of eternity. The usher is going to come forward right now and they're going to take an offering. But uh, right now, would you just picture yourselves worshiping with God? with Jesus Christ. As we sing these songs, would you think about the power, the awesomeness of God as we worship Him right now? Would you think about the book of Revelation, everything we learned as we sing the songs?